And good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number 18 of our discussion of Inferno. Uh, before we get back into the text, in which I will hopefully make more rapid progress than I did last week, uh, I am... Uh, I wanted to make an announcement. Uh, this is a, the same announcement I made last night, but I wanted to uh, just kind of continue this through this week. Um, most of you will have heard of our Signum Path program. Uh, it's our professional develop, our new professional development program, uh, focusing on communication skills and people skills and all those really, really useful things uh, that so many people uh, uh, could use help with nowadays, uh, and which do a really wonderful job job of helping to separate you from the rest of the pack, whether it comes for competing for promotions or uh, or for looking for new jobs. Um, so we just got a generous donation from one of our donors who would like to create a little scholarship program to help some other folks uh, try some PATH classes for free. So we are giving away six seats in our PATH courses that we're running in April. Um, and so the, the courses in particular that we're giving away seats for are our powerful presentations class and our nuts and bolts of writing class. Uh, so these are uh, uh, some excellent starter classes for our uh, oral communications badge and our written communications badge. Um, so if you are interested in taking one of these that are absolutely free, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be, uh, we're going to, we're, we're taking names from people who are interested and I'm going to randomly choose six of them uh, at the end of the week, like Sunday night. Uh, I'll do that. And then we'll email folks uh, for who wins. So uh, I just hope people will take advantage of this opportunity to uh, just take a completely free uh, path course. Um, if you can do this in April, that would be awesome. Uh, so um, just send an email if you are interested to path at signumu.org. So that's just P A T H at signumu.org. Uh, and just mention which of the two you would rather take, nuts and bolts or the presentations class. Uh, and let us know and we will uh, we will pick the winners and uh, and uh, give away uh, some of those seats. So that's what's uh, that's a, a fun little thing that's happening this week that I wanted to share with everybody. Um, OK, so what's. Um, oh, boy. OK, Stephen is starting off the really interesting question. <laughs> so Stephen says, thinking of the hypocrites, we've seen shades and other circles described as naked. But is this the first time we've seen some described as clothed? Are we to assume most are naked unless the clothing is part of the punishment or vice versa? Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. I think, I think, Stephen, and I might be wrong about this, but I think that nudity is the rule, not the exception. Um, I think so. I think so. Um, I don't think folks are taking their clothes with them uh, down uh, into hell. Um, yeah, I think only when it's like if it's mentioned specifically, uh, you know, it would be um, obviously, as you say, the cowls of the hypocrites uh, are, you know, the primary element uh, there. But yeah, and most other I'm trying to think like I'm just trying to run through my mind thinking about the physical descriptions that we've seen. Um, sometimes the actual uh, the actual bodies uh you know, like body parts and things are mentioned. And whenever that happens, it seems to me that they're usually naked. Like, for instance, Stephen, I'm thinking about the uh, the diviners with their heads screwed around backwards, right? Um, and the depiction, remember, there of um, their tears running down their backs and, like, uh, you know, down the, uh, you know, and to, you know, running down the cleft of their buttocks, right? So it, it seemed they were definitely naked. Um, but... Um, yeah, so I think I think that's. I mean, it's only just one sort of small illustration, but I th you know I'm thinking also, of course, of the reign of fire in the seventh circle and the people like smacking themselves with the fire. And so I don't think there's I don't think they're wearing clothes down there. I think you know they're 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 they're, they're you know they're, well, I was going to say they're flesh, except not right. They're sort of corporealized non-flesh uh, is. Uh, uh, seems to be exposed there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
And so I, I wonder about that, Stephen. Stephen says, uh, I guess it makes sense given the natural created state of mankind, right? Yeah, exactly. Is there some allegorical meaning of hypocrites being covered? Um, right. Well, I mean, of course, we have the, uh, the, the way in which their coverings themselves are, um, uh, are, is, is itself like a, a, a I mean, it, it, the covering is part of the punishment or, you know, part of the sort of outward manifestation of it. It's, it's almost like an allegorization of the sin, um, almost as directly as we've seen, uh, you know, anywhere, I think. Um, but, um, yeah, Catherine, the philosophers have robes. You mean in limbo, right? Well, that's different. I think the folks have clothes in limbo. I don't think we're supposed to imagine all the, the righteous pagans up in limbo hanging out nude all the time. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think so. Um, right, Arthur's thinking they're, they were not attractive people. They were punished by having to see each other naked. Well, I mean, very rarely, Arthur, has there been any sense of, um, you know, like titillation involved with the nudity, right? I mean, there's, we don't get a sense anywhere that like, anyone is particularly excited in any way uh, to see, I mean, like Dante, you know, like the Dante Pilgrim, I mean, there's, there's just, that, there's, that's not been an element. Although, you know, if I'm right about this, you know, w w this has been, a, it's been a pretty R-rated production all the way through, right? Nothing but nudity everywhere you go, but it's not been that kind of R-rated produ production, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, um, there hasn't been any of that kind of dynamic attached uh, to the naked bodies of the people uh, as they've been described. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and Gerald was wondering about the clothing, um, the clothing in limbo as well. And Tony, I think that's a good way to think about it, um, that it is very, there is a sense, I think, in which the nudity is part of their humiliation. But here's the other thing, Tony, is that I suspect that there's, there's a kind of irony to that, right? Because on the one hand, you know, Adam and Eve, when they were originally created, like their nudity was like part of their glory. Like there's nothing to be ashamed of, right? They're covering of themselves. They're feeling shame for themselves and kind of you know, the whole fig leaf incident, right? Um, is, um, uh, that's a consequence of the fall. And so seeing that kind of perpetuated in some ways, right? That they would desire to cover themselves. I mean, Arthur kind of coming back to the joke that you were making, right? I mean, no, they don't, they don't want to see each other. They don't want other people to see them. There's a, there's a, there's a kind of exposure, right? The nudity of the damned is, uh, is, is, is like a, a kind of, a kind of revealing, right? A kind of, uh, uncomfortable for everybody, right? Uh, nobody really wants to look around and see all of these bodies naked. Um, uh, but again, not just, it's not, not just naked, uh, you know, in a sort of a simple sense. It's because remember, all of this is ultimately allegorical. Even their body, they don't have bodies, right? Their bodies have decomposed. They're just shades. They're just spirits. And yet they're manifested visually as bodies, as naked bodies, right? sometimes tortured in altered naked bodies, again, like the diviners with their heads screwed on backwards. Um, uh, you know, it, sometimes uh, experiencing other kinds of changes, as we'll see this evening, most notably. Um, but I was even just thinking of things like getting ripped up by uh, Cerberus, for instance, right? And then presumably, I don't know what, growing back. I don't think it's a one-time thing. Um, but um, anyway, you know, that's... that's um, but again, all of that is... A manifestation, right? So the sense in which their own, you know, their own planes, their, their, like the, 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 the lack of concealment of themselves, right? They can't hide their shame. They can't hide their sin. They can't hide their guilt, um, their own ugliness, uh, even, um, Arthur, again, to come back to your point, um, it, that it, it does all, it does all seem to fit. Um, and yeah, Tony, they're exposed to scrutiny for sure. Uh, Dante scrutiny at the very least. Um, uh, again, there's not usually an audience uh, down there, which is why I think it's so interesting, you know, when we kind of think about it, right? That um, um, Dante's tour here is in a, uh, it seems crazy to say that like God's entire approach to 
like the organization of hell is done solely, you know, for Dante's sole benefit. Um, uh, I guess he's not such a little fellow in the wide world <laughs> of this wide world anyway. Um, but I mean, it does seem to be done for his, for his sole benefit. Um, uh, and his soul's benefit, Arthur. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, that's explicit, in fact, for the benefit of his soul. Um, but um, uh, but anyway, yeah. So so that's um, uh, yeah. I mean, that just kind of seems to be an element there. Um, but uh, yes, Bruce. Of course, they will get their bodies back at the Last Judgment. Um, and yes, that will make their allegorical punishments more literal. And so there is a sense in which remember they uh, talked about this, or that is uh, uh, Virgil and Dante talked about this on a couple of occasions that. Um, uh, the punishment and suffering of the damned will be perfected at the time of their re-embodiment. Um, remember even the, uh, that even the suicides are going to be to get their bodies back in a sense, right? Um, though uh, not the normal sense, right? Not the same sense everyone else will. Um, and so in that sense, in that way, the physicality, the apparent physicality, the, um, I was gonna say mock physicality, but mock is not quite right. Um, but anyway, the, the, the apparent physicality, right? Um, it's almost like it's, it's a figure of what is to come, right? It's, uh, uh, the, the, the concept of prefiguring something, um, which the word, the Greek word that that's drawn from figura means, means an outline. Um, like in a coloring book, like an outline that you fill in, right? You know, so it's it's only, um, it's just a plain outline, and then the full picture is filled in within that outline, right? That's the relationship between a figure and the thing that realizes the picture, the 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 figure. Um, I've always the the image I always have in my head when I think of fig, uh, figures and prefiguring things is Alfred Hitchcock, right? That funny little outline that is the profile of Alfred Hitchcock, though if it's the first time you've ever seen a Hitchcock film, you might not realize what those funny squiggly lines even are, right? Until like Alfred Hitchcock steps out and, and you know, fills, fills in the lines with his uh, profile. Um, and then you see, okay, like now I see what the outline is of, right? Uh, there's the actual shape uh, that, uh, uh, that the outline uh, was pointing to. There is an element, it would seem, um, Bruce, uh, for the reasons that you're pointing to, uh, that the apparent physicality of the tortures of hell are themselves a prefiguring of the reality later on. None of these shades have bodies, though we see them as if they have bodies and their bodies are described and there so many of the punishments are almost entirely bodily, as we've discussed, like though that seems to be a kind of almost dramatization, right? Uh, rather than, um, uh, you know, literal, they're not literally physical punishments. Um, and yet they perhaps they are sort of prefiguring uh, the punishments to come. But, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Yes, William. It, it is sort of like the relationship between the first music and the second music in the Aina Lindale. Yes. Yes. Or, of course, maybe, maybe it's, maybe the likeness goes the other way around. Um, but yes, yes. Okay. Anyway. But let's move on, because I'm not going to spend like a whole hour on the, <laughs> on the title slide this time. That's my that's my that's my big plan for making more progress than I did last time. So we'll see if that pans out. OK, so we still hadn't officially revealed the sin uh, for the uh, those these monkish figures in these uh, gold external lead interior um uh, robes that they're wearing, that are they're walking very, very slowly. Then they addressed me, Tuscan, you who come to this assembly of sad hypocrites, do not disdain to tell us who you are. I answered, where the lovely Arno flows, there I was born and raised, in the great city. I am with the body I have always had. But who are you, upon whose cheeks I see such tears distilled by grief? And let me know what punishment it is that glitters so. And one of them replied, the yellow cloaks are of a lead so thick, their heaviness makes us, the balances beneath them, creak. Um, the balances beneath them is 
a metaphor I don't think I understand. Um, I mean, it would seem like he's comparing their persons to like, you know, a, a balances like, a you know, to a two, two pan balances, which I guess like is kind of like the human shape in some ways, you know, like, you know, your shoulders and whatever. Um, uh, but the comparison of them, like that they are like balances that are weighed down heavily on both sides, presumably, right? Such that the beam in the middle is creaking. I think that's the metaphor being used there, but why they should be compared to balances, I mean, that would seem to um, suggest a uh, um, suggest a mercantile connection here, which itself, of course, also suggests another interesting application of the cloaks, right? Um, because there's something else we should be thinking of other than hypocrisy, just abstractly understood, right? I mean, think about it. Gold on the outside, lead on the inside. What is that? What, what does that look like? What should that make us think of? It's kind of like alchemy, Tony. It recalls alchemy in some, in some ways, right? Good. David was thinking about alchemy as well. Um, yes, yes, it's possible. But I think there's another thing, too. Yeah, fraud, says Arthur. Exactly. Um, counterfeiting. Counterfeiting, yes. Like a, like a counterfeit coin that's gold on the outside and lead on the inside, right? Um, yeah, now, like, yes. So uh, that is, of course, a form of hypocrisy. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't recall there being references here to any, like, that people are explicitly counterfeiters. Um you know, that, that, like, that this is necessarily the place that a counterfeiter would end up. Um, but it seems possible. It certainly does seem possible. Uh, it would be, I mean, fraud, yep, mm-hmm, trying to defraud other folks. So somewhere in the Malabolgia, you would expect counterfeiters to end up. Uh, they could end up in theft, but it's not just theft, right? I mean, there's, uh, there's something kind of special about that. Um, and yes, exactly, Bruce, the, the kind of, the way in which counterfeiting itself, sir, looks like almost a kind of an allegory for hypocrisy, right? For those those whitewashed tombs, right? That look beautiful on the outside, but in but internally are full of dead men's bones um, uh, and all uncleanness. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the lead coin with gold on the outside that you're trying to pass off uh, for um, uh, for full price, right? For 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 full value. Yeah, good, exactly. Sorry, David, I missed your comment down there. David Kaplan on YouTube was uh, uh, was uh, definitely thinking of counterfeiting there as well. Um, yeah, and but and again, all of this kind of works together. I love the way in you know this is this is one of the like simplest correlations, right? I mean, like there there've been a bunch of times, and there will come another time soon, like. <laughs> in about 10, 15 minutes in which uh, we're going to be asking, or at least I'm going to be asking, what's the connection? Like, why are these people punished in this way, right? I mean, often it's, sometimes it's kind of puzzling. Other times less so, right? Like the flatterers, you know, uh, who are like, uh, you know, chin deep in excrement. And there are, and, 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 the, and these guys, right? The hypocrites with these uh, weighted cloaks, uh, gold on the outside and lead on the inside. Um, the way that that maps onto the sin is, uh, is sort of uh, refreshingly clear. But I love that extra element, that, that kind of counterfeiting element, which I suppose I wouldn't have thought of had he not made that metaphor about the balances. So maybe that was why he made the metaphor about the balances. Um, but again, let me think one more time, though, about him comparing himself, like his person, I'd say his body if he had one, um, itself to the balances, right? So like you'd think if there were an identification, like the sin, a hypocrite would seem to be, like if you're choosing a metaphor for a hypocrite, it would seem to be the counterfeit coin itself. Like, you know, he is like a counterfeit coin, gold on the outside. Uh, I get Bruce, just like the whitewashed tombs, right? You know, whitewashed tombs equals counterfeit coin equals hypocrite, right? Um, that those are all, but he, he isn't comparing himself. Uh, his, the, the metaphor that he invokes there isn't comparing himself to the coin. It's comparing himself to the balances that are creaking and groaning beneath the coin, right? Beneath the weight 
of the of the coin. Um, and that's interesting. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to parse that one a little bit more allegorically. Seems worth pausing over for a second. Does it? Does it ref so one thing, and I was just kind of trying to think it through here, um, uh, trying to think it through here. Um, oh, heart, sorry, one quick second uh, here. Sorry, just responding to a, a, a YouTube comment there. Um, uh, anyone who is looking for more information on Signum University, you should email us at info at uh, But anyway, okay, so I think I through the balances metaphor here. Referring to the balances rather than just to, if, 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 they, if he just compared them even implicitly to a counterfeit coin, that's still a lovely parallel, that's still a lovely little allegory there, but it's a static allegory in the sense that it's just like, just like imagine a coin, a counterfeit coin, right? Lead on the inside, gold on the outside. Sure. The balances remind you of the transaction, right? Like it invites us to imagine the, the, the scale, right? The scale with the two pans in it in which the the coins are being weighed, right? Uh, in which, you know, so like to, to think about an actual mercantile transaction. In other words, to sort of envision the act of fraud, right? The act of passing off that coin, uh, of, um, uh, you know, the way that the, this extra weight is, you know, which, which is fraudulent weight, right? Is weighing down uh, that balance. And so he is likening maybe, I mean, I'm not sure this works exactly, but he is likening himself to like the act of the fraudulent transaction, if you see what I mean, rather than merely the static, you know, item, which is itself uh, the, uh, the, the instrument of fraud or the, the means of the fraud. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and multiple transactions, Gerald, exactly. Um, exactly. Uh Yeah, or or to put this another way, or rather, I guess just to extend that a little bit, by comparing himself to the balance, not to the coin, he is suggesting maybe that the, the coin is not like the hypocrite. The coin is like the act of hypocrisy, right? Um, that when you perform an action, which is fair seeming on the outside, but, uh, you know, full of all uncleanness on the inside, uh, when you are, you know, when you kind of trade on that difference between the appearance and the reality, um, uh, you, you are undertaking that sort of, it's like passing off a counterfeit coin, right? It's like engaging, uh, you know, putting down heavy weight in the pan of the scale, uh, which does not, in fact, have the substance uh, behind it. Um, and they are like the balances, which should be, you know, the balances are, I mean, it's a symbol of justice, um, you know, of fairness, of equity, uh, like kind of pointing to what you should be, what, you know, that, uh, and the creaking of the balances is sort of showing the weight, the inappropriate weight, the sinful weight, right? That they have done this sort of violence to themselves. Now, the heaviness of the cloaks is making them creak, right? They are being weighted down um, by these cloaks, uh, which, um, you know, like they weighted down, you know, what is happening to them is like what they did to, you know, the balances, either literal or metaphorical, uh, before. Um, yeah, and Stephen, yes, I do think coming back to your earlier point, yes, uh, that their misrepresentation of themselves um, covers up their true selves. And so again, we see that perpetuated, right? Um, had, if there were a real contrapasso, to use the word that I'm not a huge fan of, if there were, uh, if there were a real reversal, um, in hell, which there isn't, I, I, I feel f pretty strongly about. Um, if this were purgatory, Stephen, I think that the hypocrites 
would be exposed, right? Um, you correct, you would correct hypocrisy by revealing who you really are, right? Um, and like becoming acclimated to showing your true self and therefore bringing forth uh, good and, 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 and simple and, you know, useful fruit rather than false appearances. Um, again, it would be a corrective measure. In hell, less so, right? In hell, we have a perpetuation. They covered themselves. They were not, their real selves were not visible. And in hell, we see their real selves are not visible, right? They are almost completely covered in these cloaks. Very little of them can be seen at all. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, by these, you know, these emblems of hypocrisy here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Sarah, yeah, I do think it's that, that, that creaking does seem to me to sort of point to like the straining of justice, right? The strain you know, the, the way in which, um, equity justice, uh, uh, was being, you know, bent and, uh, uh, and, and, and kind of pressure, you know, the way that they were bending things. Um, and now they themselves are being bent, uh, in the same way. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. I then began, O oh, friars, your misdeeds, but said no more, because my eyes had caught one crucified by three stakes on the ground. When he saw me, that sinner writhed all over, and he breathed hard into his beard with sighs. Observing that, Fra, Cat Fra Catalano said to me, That one impaled there whom you see counseled the Pharisees that it was prudent to let one man, and not one nation, suffer. Naked, he has been stretched across the path, as you can see, and he must feel the weight of anyone who passes over him. Okay, so of course, <clears throat> Bible quiz, New Testament quiz, who are we talking about here? Who are we talking about here? Who's that? Yes, Caiaphas. Exactly, Caiaphas. Caiaphas uh, was... Uh, the high priest at the time of Jesus's crucifixion. And he is the one who made that, uh, that prediction. That's a reference to John 11. If I'm remembering my, uh, the end of John chapter 11, if I'm remembering, uh, my chapters correctly, um, uh, when he, uh, when he refers to, when he, they, they're talking, it's right after the resurrection of Lazarus. Uh, and the Pharisees are like this guy, like, uh, this guy's causing all kinds of, all kinds of trouble, right? And Caiaphas says um, that it is, uh, it is, it is prudent to let uh, one man die, uh, rather, uh, you know, in place of the whole nation. Um, in other words, uh, let's, let's get rid of this guy. Jesus, that is, being the guy in question. Um, so this is the beginning of the act of conspiracy towards the death of Jesus that John depicts. Um, why is Caiaphas here? So we've got, how does, so there are a couple things here, right, to, to sort of notice. One is that we have like two different levels here, right? We've got the, like the normal hypocrites, and we've got the special hypocrites, apparently, because he's not alone. Caiaphas is the one who's named, well, and his father-in-law, the other high priest. Um, but, um, uh, What, um, what's the difference? Why does he get the special punishment? And how does his special punishment make sense? Um, how does his special punishment make sense? Um, <laughs> well, William, when Spock said the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, he was, uh, speaking in a wholly different context of his own sacrifice, right? Which is very different from let's kill this guy so the rest of us don't get in trouble, which is basically how I understand what Caiaphas said in the, in the Gospel of John. So uh, it's a rather, rather different uh, in its application there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the... 
crucifixion seems a fairly clear, uh, a fairly clear reference, right? A fairly clear connection. Um, crucified by three stakes on the ground. Um, so he is impaled in the sense that his, his, you know, his arms and legs are impaled into the ground with stakes. So he is laid out and crucified like Jesus, but he's not up on a cross, right? He's lying down on the ground and sort of staked down onto the ground, but he's staked down in crucifixion posture. So his punishment, his torture, parallels the torture of Christ on the cross. Okay. But, and good, Stephen, he's, he's naked, not clothed. Yes, exactly. Um, so, okay. Um, but what does this have to do with hypocrisy? Why, why hypocrisy? Let me put this another way. That Dante in particular, and the medieval Christians in general, would envision Caiaphas, the high priest, who, you know, uh, directly led the conspiracy towards the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus in hell. That's not surprising, right? That that would that they would see that, right? That this that's not a shock, right? It's not a shock to find Caiaphas down here. What is a little bit more surprising to me is that he's here, right? I, you know, this is one of the several times um, where if somebody had asked me, right, you know, before we started down there, uh, if somebody had said, hey, you're going to meet Caiaphas, I wouldn't be shocked. If somebody said, okay, now tell me, here are your options, right? I'll tell you all the, all the zones and circles and rings and places uh, in hell. Where do you think he ended up? I don't think I'd have guessed hypocrisy. It would have taken me a while. I would have had many wrong guesses first uh, before I put him down uh, in the pouch of hypocrisy in the Malabolgia. In what sense? Now, on the one hand, we already have a connection here, right? Um, I've been quoting already. I just quoted again already this evening the obvious connection. The big hypocrisy speech. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, that Jesus pronounces. Uh, in, and the one I keep quoting is from Matthew, not from John. Um, what is it? Matthew 20... 24, somewhere in there. Um, but anyway, um, uh, he, um, so, I mean, you know, Jesus is denouncing the hypocrisy of the Pharisees generally, so that that would be applied, that Caiaphas would be sort of chosen as like, you know, the kind of poster child of the uh, of the hypocrite Pharisees doesn't seem like a shock at all, right? So that the Pharisees would be associated with hypocrisy seems like a no-brainer. But Caiaphas's betrayal, again, it, you know, his, it's not a betrayal exactly, not in the Judas sense betrayal of Jesus, but um, the act that's being singled out here, his declaration that it's more prudent to let one man and not one nation suffer I'm having a harder time understanding that um, uh, as hypocrisy, exactly. Um, okay, good. So uh, Tony is thinking about, um, uh, you know, because he did this under his religious authority, Stephen says Caiaphas was high priest. He was supposed to be speaking for God, uh, and yet he prophesies and acts towards the crucifixion of Christ. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and so thus the sort of the crucifixion of Christ, which he uh, contributed very significantly to bringing about, uh, sort of rebounds upon him uh, in his punishment there in his crucifixion upon the ground. Um, why? What about the... Um, what about... No. Okay, Arthur, I'm thinking... Of, to one of the comments you made before, which I really, really like, but I don't know if it works. Um, Arthur, with a keen eye for wordplay, as always, couldn't help but notice that a big part of his punishment is that he must feel the weight of anyone who passes over him. Passes over him, which seems a conspicuous phrase, as Arthur was pointing out, to use of the Jewish high priest. Um, is there a Passover 
reference here, in fact. And here's where I don't know, Arthur. Does that work in Italian? Um, I mean, the translator's choice of phrasing is evocative there. Um, does the original ta- uh, it- Italian work there for, like, with the, cro- with the Passover pun? I don't know. I don't know. Um, so uh, I'm... Uh, I'm not sure. So I can't I can't I can't speak to that. But I I think it's interesting. Um, And Timothy, I do think that there's an element here in which Caiaphas is being sort of demonstrated as the ultimate Pharisee who are known for hypocrisy. Um, And uh, yeah, the high priest who should have offered holy sacrifices, but instead committed the committed the highest evil. Um, Sure, sure. Um, Yeah, yeah. And Tony, he is laid low in crucifixion rather than raised up. Uh, uh, like, uh, like Jesus was. Um, yes, yes. Um, yeah. Um, now the weight, he does not have a cloak. So Stephen, as you were saying, he's not, he's naked, right? Whereas the other, uh, the other sinners here are wearing their punishment cloaks. But he, of course, is receiving the weight of all of their punishment cloaks as they are walking over him. He must feel the weight of anyone who passes over him. Um, He is bearing, as it were, the punishment of them all, which seems to me to be another... Just as his declaration, right, his statement that it was prudent to let one man and not one nation suffer is a statement that works in multiple directions. Right? On the one hand, on the literal level, what, he, what Caiaphas, what the character Caiaphas in the Gospel of John is saying is, okay, let's kill this guy so that we don't get in trouble. Like literally, that's, uh, that seems to be the literal meaning of what he says. If we can contrive to get this dude executed, um, then we, because if we don't, then like the people are like, you know, he's causing a big stir among the people. And remember, they were an occupied nation at the time. We don't want the Romans coming down on us and thinking that we're, you know, because they were proclaiming him as king and everything could get really dodgy really fast with the Romans. So let's get rid of this guy. Right. And save ourselves. Right. Save our nation as a result. Um, so. That's literally what Caiaphas seems to be suggesting in that passage. But of course, as the passage points out, what he says is true on another level that he himself does not anticipate, right? It is more prudent that one man and not the whole nation should should suffer. His words, though he does not intend them in this way in any way at all, nevertheless are true on a spiritual level, that Jesus shall, in fact, take upon himself the suffering of the entire nation. Um... And that it is, in fact, more prudent that Jesus should die than that everybody should suffer. The, the, uh, the sort of dramatic irony of that moment is a really important element there uh, in the story. And that we can see that same kind of dramatic irony. Again, like Jesus, because Jesus does bear the, the, bear the sin, bear the punishment, take upon himself the weight of the punishment of everyone else. Right. Um, and that's why it is. Again, that's why the, the sort of the spiritual realization, the ironic, dramatically ironic spiritual realization of Caiaphas's words that he is it is more prudent for him to suffer than for the whole nation to suffer. Um, and here is Caiaphas now. Again, so just he is. Crucified as Jesus was crucified and he is bearing the weight of everybody else in the circle upon his body. Um uh, and so that, that, that seems, that parallel seems an important one. That again, it's like that dramatic irony is being borne home uh, on him there. Um, I, guess that's, I guess that works. I guess that's enough uh, for me to understand uh, this here. Um, he must feel the weight of anyone who passes over him. Yes, yes. Um, y- 
good, Stephen, yes, the sacrificial thing, too, right? As a high priest, he's responsible for making sacrifices. Yes, and of course, rendered Jesus, uh, you know, Jesus was the, was, you know, the sacrifice uh, for people's sin. And so he does, again, there's like the dramatic irony there, right? He's trying to get Jesus, he's betraying Jesus to death, uh, right? Just to, to try to save everybody, you know, to, to save their own skins. Um, uh, but of course, he does end up though not by his intention. Just as his declaration is true on the spiritual level, though he doesn't know it, um, his act, though he doesn't know it and doesn't intend it, there's, again, this disjunction between his intention and what he thinks he's doing and what is actually accomplished, right? He does actually, essentially, assist to render up uh, the ultimate sacrifice uh, there. Um, and, um, uh, and now he is sort of... Uh, again, that's kind of the, 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 this, I'm still not exactly able to like precisely lay my finger on the way I'd need to think this out a little bit more exactly what the, the, the link of the relationship between how this is kind of Dante is showing this to be re, sort of rebounding onto him, both the crucifixion and the, you know, taking the sins of others upon himself, literally, um, the way that he is laid out in this almost sacrificial way. Um, I mean, he's not making it easier for anybody else, of course. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. So okay, there's, there's, I don't feel like I've perfectly articulated the link there. I feel like I'm still just kind of waving my hand vaguely at it, but it's almost there. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to refine it fully on the fly here, but um, uh, but I think it kind of works, mostly works. Um, okay. At the end of the canto, this is still canto 23, when we're in with the hypocrites. Um, he answered, closer than you hope, you, you'll find a rocky ridge that stretches from the great round wall and crosses all the savage valleys, except that here it's broken, not a bridge. But where its ruins slope along the bank and heap up at the bottom, you can climb. Notice that once again, a broken bridge, which was presumably broken at the time of the harrowing of hell, as before, uh, you know, the other structural damage that we've seen to hell that was done at that point, is once again serving as a uh, well, not a bridge, serving as a, a, a point of egress, right? Um, as a, a, a means by which Dante can travel between one part of hell and another, as was the broken slope uh, down into the seventh circle before. Uh, anyway, okay, but where it's ruined slope, all right, you, you can climb, I said that. My leader stood a while with his head bent, then said... He who hooks sinners over there gave us a false account of this affair. Ah, oh, the lies of the devils in the, uh, uh, in the pouch of graft has been revealed. At which the friar, in Bologna, I once heard about the devil's many vices. They said he was a liar and father of lies. Yeah, newsflash, Virgil. <laughs> Demons don't always tell you the truth. Oh, we all learned something today. And then my guide moved on with giant strides, somewhat disturbed, with anger in his eyes. At this I left those overburdened spirits while following the prints of his dear feet. Okay, so yes, the sudden but inevitable, but inevitable betrayal of the demons has been revealed. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Kit, I doubt... Kit has been looking into this. I doubt that Arthur's Passover pun works there. And if the words don't work, is there anything else in it to suggest Passover? I mean, there's the connection with crucifixion, and, you know, with the crucifixion of Jesus and Passover, which, of course, like, those things are quite intimately connected, obviously, in the New Testament. Um, but... Hmm. Let me think about that a little bit more a second. I don't think so. Because passing over, like, it's a, 
if the wordplay itself doesn't make the connection, what's being described is is quite different, right? I mean, the sense in which the Passover, like the sense in which something is being passed over in the sense of the Jewish Passover is like the angel of death passing over the house that is like skipping over, not stopping there, right? Um, whereas the passing over that's happening as they troop over him is just literally like we have to cross over his person. Um, so they're like not skipping over him, they're stepping on him along the way. Um, so it doesn't seem to be anything like the same sense of the concept of Passover. So if the concept is so different and the words are not the same, I don't think it can work. Um, Thank you, Kit. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, it's, yeah, we'll see. Um, check out that line, the Passover line, uh, Kit, in the Italian version, and uh, see if you can see any connection there. But I'm increasingly doubtful. I'm increasingly doubtful. <laughs> right? Arthur says, that's Dante's fault, not mine. Agreed. 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 It's Dante's loss. He had an opportunity for a perfectly good pun and didn't use it. Um, uh, Dante's no Shakespeare, meaning he can resist the temptation to make a pun, as Shakespeare never could. Um, but anyway, uh, okay. The revelation of the deception, of the fraud perpetrated by the demons, um, is really interesting to me. What's really interesting to me is that Virgil is so mad he is really put out by this. Um, and the friar that they're talking to is almost patronizing, right? In Bologna, I once heard about the devil's many vices. Uh, they said he was a liar and the father of lies. Yeah, they say that in lots of places. I don't think that was just a Bolognese uh, saying there, uh, uh, Fra Catalano. It's, um, that's, it's well known. That's, that's in the Bible, right? So, um, Yes, he's a liar and the father of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It seems almost mm, patronizing, almost like he's mocking them. Right, like, I'm almost tempted to interpret those three lines, like what the friar says to them, as basically like, you guys aren't such simps that you actually believed the demons, right, when they told you that story, right? Surely you you remember the very basic thing. Uh, uh, I mean, again, even like his uh, deliberate, which sounds almost like comical understatement. Um, in Bologna, I once heard about the devil's been, it came up once. Like it, I, this, this obscure thing was quoted to me once, you know, but I, but I remember it, you know, I remember this strange thing, you know, that I once learned that uh, the devil's a liar, right? Maybe you haven't heard that, but you know, I, I did. Now, of course, Virgil, you could say has more excuse than many because the New Testament hadn't been written yet when he was alive, but still, um, still, it would seem to point out, um, yeah, yeah. Um, no, Stephen, I don't think Stephen has asked a good question. Is he mocking them? Is the friar mocking them? Or is Dante mocking friars, who apparently are so unlearned in Scripture that they base their theology on sayings that they overheard? No, uh, most people base their theology on sayings that they overheard in the sense that most people are illiterate, and so they would have heard it, uh, is, where they, is what they would have done. Um, so I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, uh, not that many friars aren't ignorant, but that's... Well, it could work in one sense, Stephen. Um, friars are supposed to be like kind of the, the point of them is kind of to be going around teaching people. Um, so an ignorant friar is in this, you know, pouch of hypocrisy tracks, you know, um, that, I mean, that does track in that sense, but, um, um, but it's still just, it's still kind of, I don't know. It sounds a little smarmy to me, uh, the way that he's saying it. Again, it's not, um, this is, this is, I, I think he's heard that more than once. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe. It's possible, Stephen. I mean, I think that, you know, that, that reading that, uh, you know, if we, if we don't say that the friar is deliberately mocking them, um, but that the friar is himself coming in for some mockery here in the way that he's phrasing this, that he's bringing this out as if it were this obscure piece of learning, when in fact it's not. And it's a very unobscure piece of learning uh, that most anybody should have heard. Um, that, that could be a kind of a backhanded slap at friars in general, him in particular. Um, I definitely can't rule that out. But I still can't help but notice that the, at the end of the day, Virgil's the one who ends up looking bad. Dante, the pilgrim, doesn't seem to care, right? The prince of his dear feet, right? He's still following in Virgil's footsteps. Um, yeah, yeah. And yes, good point, Bruce. I had forgotten about that, Bruce. You're right. Um, uh, that that passage in the Bible is linked to the Pharisees. Yes, yes. Jesus' uh, statement about... Uh, the devil being the father of lies. Um, so yes, it's lo locally relevant uh, here in the uh, uh, in the area of uh, Caiaphas and the uh, uh, and the Pharisees. Hang on with Virgil, because we have another thing. Here's where we start the next canto with Virgil, and I don't get this. Another one, another one of the many things I don't understand. In that part of the young year, when the sun begins to warm its locks beneath Aquarius, and nights grow shorter, equaling the days, when Hoarfrost mimes the image of his white sister upon the ground, but not for long, because the pen he uses is not sharp, the farmer who is short of fodder rises and looks and sees the fields all white, at which he slaps his thigh, turns back into the house, and here and there complains like some poor wretch who doesn't know what can be done, and then goes out again and gathers up new hope on seeing that the world has changed its face in so few hours, and he takes his staff and hurries out his flock of sheep to pasture. So did my master fill me with dismay when I saw how his brow was deeply troubled, yet then the plaster soothed the sore as quickly, for soon as we were on the broken bridge, my guide turned back to me with that sweet manner I had first I had I first had seen along the mountain's base. That is when you first met him. Okay, this is as far as I can remember the longest and most heavily elaborated single simile in the entire inferno so far. It's like a full narrative here, right? The, it's almost like a parable. It's so long, right? Um, do you follow the parable here, right? So we've got hoarfrost, right? This sort of particularly heavy kind of frost, which makes the whole ground look completely white and so can be mistaken for a covering of snow, which is apparently what's been happening here. So the farmer in Aquarius, that part of the young year, uh, when the sun begins to warm its locks beneath Aquarius and nights grow shorter, equaling the days. So the hoarfrost is miming the image of his white sister, which is snow, upon the ground. Um, so the farmer who is short of fodder, that is, therefore, he was hoping to bring his sheep out to pasture because he doesn't have enough fodder to feed them, which he would need if it were there were snow on the ground and they couldn't find any grass. So he'd have to feed them fodder indoors, but he doesn't have enough. So he's upset. He looks and he sees the fields all white and he slaps his thigh and turns back into the house and complains like some poor wretch who doesn't know what can be done. But then he goes out again and sees all... The apparent snow has melted. It's not snow after all. It's just a horror frost, and it's passed off already. And so he takes new hope and takes his staff and hurries out his flock of sheep to pasture. That is how Virgil was like, apparently, in his response to the news of their deception. Um... Yeah. 
Now Sarah says, uh, it doesn't even really make sense. A farmer should know what frost is like and that it will soon melt. Yeah, Sarah, I can't also can't shake the thought that this farmer is not a great farmer, right? Nor a great person, right? I mean, he's just like, he's going back into the house. So he's first a fool, mistaking hoarfrost for snow. Um, and then secondly, like, what does he do when he finds the fields covered with what he believes to be snow erroneously? Just turns back into the house and here and there complains like some poor wretch who doesn't know what can be done. Right, so he just goes and whines about it. I mean, it's not a good look. It's just not. Uh, so, what is the message? Virgil is like an incompetent and morally questionable farmer. Really? That, that's that's what we're going with? Um yeah, now, Bruce, I do understand that Dante is no farmer, uh, but it doesn't take a wild leap of imagination to imagine that a farmer would be able to tell the difference. Again, I, d I don't think he's suggesting that farmers on the whole are continuously making this error, right? That I don't think he's assuming, uh, I don't think Dante's assuming that no farmer can tell the difference between hoarfrost and snow. Um, and again, it's the turning back into the house and here and there complains like some poor wretch who doesn't know what can be done. Um, the, not just the helplessness, but the complaining. I, I just, that, I don't think this is an exemplary farmer. It, exemplary in any sense. It, because he's, he's, he's wrong. He's wrong. The hoarfrost mimes the image of the snow and so therefore can possibly be mistaken for it at first glance if you're not careful if you're a sucker right i mean if you don't know what you're doing if you i mean if you just take one really superficial look and then turn immediately back inside and spend all your time whining and complaining instead of going out and actually checking things out yourself um uh yeah yeah. Now, let's see. That's an interesting theory, Sarah. Let's think about that more. Um, Sarah's suggesting that I'm misreading the simile entirely. She says, isn't Dante the farmer and Virgil the frost. Let's see. Okay. So did my master fill me with dismay when I saw how his brow was deeply troubled, yet then the plaster soothed the sore as quickly. You're so right, Sarah. You're exactly right. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, Sarah, that helps me so much. Excellent. Great work. You're completely right. It is Dante who is himself the incompetent farmer. D Dante the pilgrim, right? And it is Virgil's aspect. So he mistakes Virgil's... He's looking at Virgil's brow, right? Virgil's aspect. And he mistakes... He sees that Virgil's upset. And he mistakes it for a blanket of snow on the ground. When it's just hoarfrost, right? It looks like snow, but it passes off very quickly. And then he takes new hope. So Virgil is the frost or Virgil's countenance, right? The, <clears throat> the trouble on Virgil's brow is the hoarfrost. Mistaken for snow. Dante is the farmer, and the sheep... Uh, who are the sheep being driven out to pasture? Who are the sheep being driven out to pasture? Uh, or what is the sheep being driven out to pasture? Or I guess the driving out to pasture, like he um, uh, he takes his staff and hurries out his flock of sheep to pasture, goes about his work, right? Goes about fulfilling his duty and obligations, right? Um, so there doesn't have to be a literal, like, 
what do the sheep sheep represent kind of reading of this, but rather just as the farmer goes and takes his sheep out already, um, which arguably he should have done earlier, right? Um, so Dante is now doing his duty, which is to follow along behind Virgil, except he was already doing that. Sorry, I'm still puzzling over what are the sheep or like what is the parallel of the taking the sheep out to pasture. Um, and then he uses a healing metaphor. Yet then the plaster soothed the sore as quickly. Like if you have an open wound and you put a, a sticking plaster on it um, and that soothes it so that it's not exposed to further irritation. Um, when I saw how his brow was deeply troubled, yet then the plaster soothed the sore as quickly. For soon as we were on the broken bridge, my guide turned back to me with that sweet manner I first had seen along the mountain's base. So it's his sweet manner, which is like the plaster that soothes the sore, which was Dante's upsetness, right, at the sight of Virgil's discombobulation and uh, anger. So perhaps, Devorah, Dante's courage is the sheep, right? So, like, so he musters his courage uh, in following along. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Sarah's following up saying the sheep are the task to be done, which is not actually impeded by the perceived problem, right? Yeah, so the task to be done, which is to put the sheep out to pasture, which he thought he couldn't ha he couldn't do, but now he realizes that he can do and really kind of could have done all along. Um, so Sarah adds, Virgil is in fact still able to lead him on and continue their task. Um, so he's, he's going to be able to, he, Dante, is going to be able to continue. And so the leading the sheep out to pasture is continuing the tour through uh, through hell, right? I'm going to continue seeing, like, I'm going to continue my sightseeing tour, which is his, Dante's duty, right? Um, and he's going to be able to do that. He was afraid that he might not be able to because Virgil's mad, right? Virgil's upset. And if Virgil's upset, then that suggests to him, Dante Pilgrim, that they're, maybe they're not going to be able to continue, right? Um, so I'm going to now be able to put my sheep out to pasture, yeah. Good. You're on a roll here, Sarah. You're good at this. Uh, uh, excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, I think that works. I think that works. Um, sorry, I'm just kind of pausing for a moment because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of recalibrating now, Sarah, with this new understanding of this passage. Recalibrating my reaction to those first, like, 15 lines, right? This simile, the really, really long simile. If what he's dwelling on is not Virgil's incompetence, but his own simple and ignorant response to Virgil, interpretation of Virgil, it's, it's not, again, it's not Virgil he's dwelling on, it's himself that he's dwelling on. Um, And of course, the other thing that I'm thinking about here for a moment is where they are. Hypocrisy, that is. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, right, Michael's saying his own misestimation when he should have learned enough to know better by now. Yes, to trust in his dear guide, right? To know that everything's going to be fine, that there's not going to be any impediment. He doesn't have to um, turn back into the house and here and there complain like some poor wretch who doesn't know what can be done, right? That's, that's not going to happen. Um, he should know that. Um, even if they have to cool their heels outside the gates of Dees for a little while, they're not going to have to, he's not going to be thwarted in taking his sheep out to pasture. Yeah. Um... Um, <laughs> oh, wow, Arthur. That one was unusually... Uh, <laughs> no. 
because there are no goats involved here, Arthur. But anyway, never mind. Never, never mind. Sorry. Never mind. Um, okay. The effect, the overall effect, therefore, is one of humility, not self-effacement, but of, you know, self it's sort of inviting us to laugh at him, not at Virgil, which makes me feel better in some ways. It's simpler. It's nicer. It's easier. Um, and notice, by the way, notice the way that. Dante is turning epic similes. Epic similes, like in Virgil, I mean in Virgil's poem, I mean in the Aeneid, don't work exactly like this. Or in Homer, not that Dante had read Homer, but um, this is not the way that epic similes usually work, right? Um, they do, usually they help us picture things, right? You know, like they ask us to imagine a particular thing, often with like some narrative attached to it. Um, and it can be quite elaborate. But the function of it is to get us to like picture the sight or hear the sound of something, which we're then going to be told is like this other thing. Right. Um, the general trend. Here's a pretty big statement. Maybe it's even true. Um, I don't have time to scrutinize it thoroughly and go through my Virgil and uh, Homer to see if this is right. But it seems to me that the general trend in epic similes is to help in this kind of visualization or conceptualization, perhaps, of a particular um, phenomenon, like oral or visual phenomenon, perhaps, usually. Um, but notice how Dante is kind of turning the epic simile tradition. Um, this is not an epic simile like that at all. In fact, as you see immediately by the excellent allegorical interpretation that Sarah was making there, um, it's, it's, it's like an allegory, right? Um, and I think that Sarah is exactly right to allegorize it, not just that her, I think her reading is, is spot on, um, but the, her process is spot on, right? The, the proper thing here is not like, okay, let's try to see the thing that he's trying to ask us to picture. And then what are we supposed to compare to that? Cause ultimately a simile is a comparison. That's what it does. That's the purpose of it. Right. Um, and here it's not, it, that this isn't exactly a comparison, right? Again, it's certainly, it works like an epic simile, but it isn't exactly an epics. It's not just a comparison. It's more like an allegory. And for us to parse it like an allegory, as we've done, you know, Virgil's demeanor is the frost and uh, uh, and Dante is the farmer. And what are the sheep, you know, that are being led out to pasture? That's exactly the kind of question that this, again, more like a parable than a simile, um, invites us, invites us to do. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it is a strange feeling revision, Jocelyn, isn't it? To imagine a learned society unfamiliar with Homer. It is so hard, especially since in the Middle Ages, they're constantly making references to the Trojan War and like all of these Homeric things, right? And even referring to Homer himself. Um, it is really hard to forget. No, sorry. It is really hard to remember um, uh, that um, they didn't know Homer. Um, it's such an easy thing to lose sight of. This is going to come up very forcefully soon, hopefully as soon as next week, because um, we're going to meet Odysseus. And boy, the temptations to be thinking about Homer for us are huge uh, or to be like, but he's not getting Odysseus right. Remember, this is not uh, this is Ulysses. It's not Odysseus, right? This is the Ulysses of the Aeneid, not the Odysseus of the Odyssey uh, that he's referring to. So. Um, that's one of the places, Jocelyn, where we're going to feel that tension most, I think, uh, in, in the entire Inferno. Um, yeah. Okay. And were it not that down from this enclosure, the slope was shorter than the bank before, I cannot speak for him, but I should surely have been defeated. But since Malabolgia runs right into the mouth of its last well, the placement of each valley means it must have one bank higher and have the other short. 
and so we reached at length the jutting where the last stone of the ruined bridge breaks off. The breath within my lungs was so exhausted from climbing I could not go in, go on. In fact, as soon as I had reached that stone, I sat. Um... Okay, first of all, just new inform we weren't we didn't know this before. Um he's never mentioned that like the bridges are going down and down and down that uh the inner wall of each pouch is lower than the outer wall of each pouch. Um so that as we're going in Malabolgia we're conti he's continuing as he's going from wall top to wall top uh and pouch to pouch he's continuing to descend. Um and that's and that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, but um, uh, Dante's physical strain here um, is also interesting to me. There have been other times when his bodily weight has been emphasized. There have been other moments when potential bodily danger to his person has come up. This is one of the few times in which his the, the, the physical strain of his journey is emphasized in this, where he's just been tuckered out, right? He can barely make the climb. What I can't help but think about here, though, is that it only happens down here in the circle of fraud. Um... Are we supposed to be thinking about hypocrisy still? He's climbing out of the circle of, you know, the, the pocket of hypocrisy. Is it hard for him to get out of hypocrisy? Is there, is there some reason for that? Um, of course, it is true that these shades, the shades of the hypocrites, are weighted down by their weighted cloaks, right? Their leaden cloaks. Dante is also weighed down by his flesh, by his body, right? Um, and so his reference to the difference, um, I cannot speak for him, but I should surely have been defeated. Um, no, he can't speak for Virgil. And again, as from all that we've seen, I doubt Virgil is breathing hard right now because Virgil doesn't have a body, but Dante does have a body. It's hauling his heavy carcass up the hill uh, that makes him pant uh, and uh, and so tired. Um, exactly. Which does seem, Bruce, I agree, to um, uh, to connect him with the punishments as we've just seen. It's exactly what I'm what I'm thinking about, Bruce. Um, I, he seems to be connecting himself with all manner of fraud. Fraud seems to be a touchy point with himself. Um, and it's something that I'm really interested to see. I'd never noticed all of these things. There's some, I mean, like his swoon in the circle of lust is super famous, right? And lots of people talk about that. Um, some people talk about his first swoon and you're right. He keeps swooning all over the place. Jocelyn totally need to get him a fainting couch, but, um, uh, you know, so talking about his swoon up before, you know, just inside the, or just outside the gates. But, um, uh, or was it inside the gates? No, it was outside the gates. Um, anyway, like it's that's a lot of people talk about that, but I'd never really noticed all of these ways in which he keeps paralleling himself, not with every single one, but with so many of the sinners, so many of the punishments here in the Malabonja. Um, fraud. Fraud seems to be, there seems to be a, this kind of thread of confession going all the way through. I mean, which elements of fraud you know, is he completely f clear of uh, simony, right? Uh, again, no necessary virtue to himself that he never committed simony. Um, uh, uh, flattery, I don't think he, he didn't seem to, he didn't get anything on himself. You know, he didn't have to launder his, uh, his, his clothing after passing through uh, the pouch of the flatterers. But, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it is interesting. I mean, I, 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 Bruce, I would definitely read it the same way there. Now you must cast aside your laziness, my master said, for he who rests down, rests on down or under covers cannot come to fame, and he who spends his life without renown leaves such a vestige of himself on earth as smoke bequeaths to air or foam to water. Therefore, get up, defeat your breathlessness with spirit that can win all battles if the body's heaviness does not deter it. A longer ladder still is to be climbed. 
It's not enough to have left them behind. If you have understood, now profit from it. Okay. All right. Yeah, and Bruce, you're right. The Jerion incident at the beginning and the way that he associates Jerion and the, the effigy of fraud with allegory and his poem, yes, also sets the stage for all that at the beginning. I agree with that. Um, Devora, I find this really interesting, too. And I'm trying to... Here's, here's, my, here's my basic question. Here's my basic question here. Virgil's speech about fame... Why shouldn't you be lazy? Well, because if you're lazy, you cannot come to fame. And that's important, because he who spends his life without renown leaves such a vestige of himself on earth as smoke bequeaths to air or foam to water. In other words, none at all, right? Just as smoke is, is uh, uh, you know, dispersed through the air and goes away and no one can know where it was, or foam spreads out and is gone on the surface of the water... So your own life will be, you know, evaporated and will leave no permanent trace upon the earth if you don't have fame. That's why it's important. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm reading this. You know, I've read my Boethius often enough to read this and kind of I'm like waiting for the punchline here. Like I, Vir Virgil, for real? We're, are we being for real here? Virgil? Fame? That's, that's what this is all about? Leaving a lasting mark on the earth? That's, that's, that's why Dante should get up and defeat his breathlessness. That's his goal? R really? Really? It is a rather paganish view of fame's importance, Jennifer. I agree. Um, it's, um, uh, I mean, very Roman, sure. I mean, it's not that I can't imagine Virgil in life saying that, saying this, right? But, you know, presumably he's learned a few, like, I, I just, it almost sounds like, hang on, is this a trap? But here's the other thing. Maybe... This is not right. This is not right. But whose error is this? Virgil's error? Dante's er error? It's possible, right? I mean, just because it's in Boethius doesn't mean that everybody abided by it, right? That everybody took it to heart. Maybe Dante himself, Dante the poet, I mean, really thinks this way about fame. If you wanted to make that argument, if you wanted to make the argument that Dante believes that fame is super, super important, you can put together that argument. There are a bunch of other passages you could find as well. Remember all that stuff about, you know, um, like the way that he, like when he's uh, talking to uh, some of the damned souls who are trying to clear things up, right? And it's even offered, like Virgil even offers it to people to say like, hey, you know, if you're good, he'll do you a favor and he'll clear up your name back in the world so that everybody says good things about you as if it matters. Right. As if fame is important. So you can build the argument that says there is, in fact, a baseline belief throughout Inferno that Dante, the poet, is taking fame quite seriously and really believes that establishing your mark permanently on Earth matters a great deal. Um, matters more than like Lady Philosophy would perhaps argue. Um, yeah. Yeah, Dante is very concerned with getting his laurels, Bruce. I mean, I, I think that that's a possible reading. I mean, this is a thing. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm laughing because this is something I've encountered a bunch of uh, a bunch of times, both in other people's readings and in my own as well. I mean, there are... Um, uh, the number of times that I've caught even my myself doing this when you read something, okay, like, you know what the Bible teaches, right? And more, you know not only what the Bible teaches, you know what, like, 
the medieval Christian tradition teaches, right? Like what the fathers, you know, the Latin fathers say about this and, and all that kind of thing. And you, so, you know, like this is, this is what, this is what people believed, right? This is the thing. And then you come across a passage which seems to contradict that, right? And you're like, oh man, this is, this creates this huge problem. Uh, and it's like, well, haven't you ever met anybody whose practices don't in fact follow their theoretical beliefs? Like that shouldn't be so strange to discover, right? I mean, there's this kind of charming assumption that I've often seen in interpretation of medieval Christian works that like, because they were Christian and like we, therefore we have this list of things that they're supposed to believe in and they're supposed to do that. They all do it right. <laughs> right? That it's that they're, that it creates some like hideous dilemma. If it turns out that like, in fact, you know, uh, not only their practice, but even, you know, many of the things that they believe in don't in fact jive either with the Bible or even with what, uh, uh, you know, their contemporary, uh, you know, Christian teachers would have told them. Um, so again, uh, like, you know, or, you know, taking Boethius again as an illustration, just because Boethius says it's true and was held to be true by, uh, uh, you know, by, by so many, doesn't mean that everybody lived that way, right? Doesn't mean that everybody bought into that. Um, so it's, I, I can't rule it out. Right. I can't I can't rule it out. Um, but um, and, you know, David says that actually fits their location, leaving the circle of the hypocrites quite nicely. Yeah. And David, that's exactly why I hesitate here. Right. If this were just some other random place, if this were some other random place. I would feel more confident in saying, OK, OK. Maybe this is what Dante really believes, right? Maybe he's just profane, right? And he's, he's, um, you know, uh, not taking exception with, but, uh, you know, um, agreeing to disagree with lady philosophy at this particular point, right? I'd be more comfortable saying that if this didn't happen on the road out of the circle of hypocrisy, right? Um, because that's exactly, you know, achieving fame is one of the things, like, it's one of the things that hypocrites are going for, right? It's one of the things that activates hypocrisy. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it just seems kind of conspicuous. So it gives me pause. Because it's like, a little too on the nose, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, enough to make me suspicious. Enough to make me suspicious. But suspicious of what? What is a suspicious reading? So if a non-suspicious reading of this is that Dante is just like, yep, uh, fame is where it's at. Um, ignore Lady Philosophy's teaching about the transitory nature of fame and therefore the uh, pointlessness of investing any of your, you know, intentions or uh, motivations on the acquisition of fame. Um, the suspicious reading would be something like, here's Virgil talking like a pagan, right? Jennifer, exactly like you were saying, um, that we're seeing the imperfections of Virgil's own understanding of how things work. Virgil, of course, has not read Boethius, right? Because he didn't have the benefit of Boethius. Um, now, again, he's learned a lot. Many things have been revealed to him since his death in limbo, uh, like while he's been in limbo. But um, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Devor, I agree. It does fit well here, but he doesn't say it only here. I exactly, exactly. So, I mean, I, 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 I don't think it's, I don't think it's cut and dried. Um, but it could be, I guess, so again, my suspicious reading is that we're supposed to see, we're supposed to be uncomfortable. That in hearing Virgil say this, we're like, that's, um, you know, Virgil, that stuff about fame is not exactly, you know, A1 theory with our lot, you know. Um, that's, that's uh, you know. We stopped believing that after the Roman period. It's uh, we've we've uh, we know better 
now, um, post post Boethius, right about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, the famous Virgil's fraud. Well, not fraud in the sense of him like defrauding or trying to cheat someone, but um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to connect those two. Well, let me go on. Let's just kind of let's just kind of keep this in mind. Keep this in the back of our minds, and we'll see uh, if we come across other places where we see uh, where we see this theme come up again. Uh, we'll sort of try to return to the fame theme uh, if we see it uh, continue. Um, okay. What do we get on the other side? Snakes. All the snakes, right? He describes the snakes, which are more snakes than places that have lots of snakes, right? Uh, and now he's describing the sinners. Among this cruel and depressing swarm ran people who were naked. There you go, Stephen. Definitely naked people here. Um, which I think he's specifying because the people in the, in the last one were not naked, right? So we're reasserting the nakedness, which I suspect to have been general beforehand. Though maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, sorry. Among this cruel and depressing swarm of snakes ran people who were naked, terrified, with no hope of a whole or heliotrope. Um, heliotrope as snake repellent here of some, or snake protection, a hole to hide from snakes in, I think. Though that's not the number one place I would go to hide from snakes, I think. But, um, okay. Um, ran people, okay, uh, Anyway, their hands were tied behind by serpents. These had thrust their head and tail right through the loins and then were knotted on the other side. Okay, so the sinners have their hands behind their backs and snakes are wrapped around their wrists tying their hands together behind their backs. And then the serpents have thrust their the head and tail of the snake tying their hands together, thrust through their loins, and then were knotted on the other side. So the snakes wrapped around their hands have the, the two snake ends, head and tail, ends of snake, skewered through the body? Like through the torso of the people? So if they've got their hands behind their backs, their hands are down by their waists. So what, the snakes, the head and tail, are they coming through by the other side, meaning entirely the other side of the torso? So like the head and tail of the snake are emerging like at their hips? ish something like that right so you've got the two ends of snake emerging from the front of their pelvis and then tied off in the front is that am i understanding that properly um yeah between their legs hmm right through the loins Maybe, maybe the head and the tail wrap under the crotch underneath. But then what are they knotted for? And we're, we're, they, they, that wouldn't secure anything, right? I think they're impaled because a lot of there's a lot of impaling by snakes. There's a lot of penetration in this. Uh, Do you notice that trend, right? Towards bodily transfixing and penetration that happens here. The snakes are... Uh, invasive in this circle. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> those of you who are in the comments box currently making uh, uncomfortable noises, I hear you. And I think we're supposed to be uncomfortable. 
I'm dwelling on this in part because it is one of the most noteworthy elements of Cantos 24 and 25 that we get a very great deal of physical description. Dante really seems to want us to visualize what's going on here. And even though it's uncomfortable in lots of different ways, right? We've got like whole bunches of different groups of people who will be uncomfortably triggered by these descriptions. And I'm not trying to downplay that, but Dante wants us to visualize this. The visual, um, the detailed visual descriptions that he gives are, um, uh, noteworthy in this section. Um, okay, so oh, let's keep going. And there, a, a serpent sprang with force at one who stood upon our shore. Uh, that is on this side. Transfixing him just where the neck and shoulders form a knot. Um, like base of the base of the neck back here, right? So this serpent leaps out and hits him right, I guess, back here, right? No O or no O or E has ever been transcribed so quickly as that soul caught fire and burned, and as he fell, completely turned to ashes. And when he lay undone upon the ground, the dust of him collected by itself and instantly returned to what it was. Okay. Okay. So a snake doesn't bite him. It skewers him in the spine. And when it skewers him in the spine, he catches fire and burns to ashes instantly. Right? Thanor style. But, unlike Fanor, recycles himself. He then re is re immediately reconstituted, and he's back. Okay. Out of curiosity, what sin is this dude uh, guilty of, you think? Any guesses? What flavor of fraud is this dude? We've not been told yet, right? We've not been told. <laughs> it's arson. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Identity theft. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Identity theft. <laughs> this would be the perfect circle for identity thieves. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Dante is centuries before his time. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah. Um, okay. No idea. Let's keep going and try to put together a bigger picture here. Just so. Hang on. Before, before I get to just so. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I didn't skip any lines. This is the immediate next passage. Just so. It is asserted by great sages that when it reaches its 500th year, the phoenix dies and then is born again. Lifelong, it never feeds on grass or grain, only drops of incense and amomum. I have no idea what that is. Its final winding sheets are nard and myrrh. And just as he who falls and knows not how, by demon's force that drags him to the ground, or by some other hindrance that binds man, who, when he rises, stares about him, all bewildered by the heavy anguish he has suffered, sighing as he looks around, so did this sinner stare when he arose. Oh, how severe it is, the power of God, that, as its vengeance, showers down such blows." What? Okay. Phoenix, I get. The Phoenix, I get. Okay, no. I don't get it. Um, um, oh, really? Amamum is related to cardamom? 
Like cardamom and lavender? Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, cool. There we go. I learned something. Where's the stress? Amamum? Like cardamom? Okay. Huh. Interesting. Um, anyway. All right. So... When I say I get the phoenix, I mean I understand what he's talking about. I don't understand exactly why he's talking about it. It seems like... I mean, okay, like I, I mean, I see the parallel, right? I mean, he's just burned and fallen into ash, and then he's reconstituted himself. Like, sure, it makes you think of the phoenix. Why wouldn't it? Um, but... The phoenix... Now... Put on your allegory hats. Here's an allegory quiz. Or it's not exactly a quiz in the same sense. It's like an allegory test, right? Put on your medieval allegory hat. Phoenix, what do you got? Allegorize the phoenix. When we read when we read about the phoenix, we should be thinking of what? Resurrection! Absolutely. That's that's, that's kind of a slow pitch right there, right? Absolutely, we're thinking about resurrection, right? Yeah, yeah, just like resurrection. This guy's not, it's not exactly resurrection. Or if it is, it's a, a strange just kind of parallel to resurrection, right? A mockery, almost? Of resurrection? Okay. The winding sheets of nard and myrrh kind of puts me in a Jesus in the tomb pre-resurrection frame of mind there. Right? Um, especially with the myrrh. Remembering back to the wise men at the, you know, uh, birth of Jesus. Um... Yeah, Devorah, it, this is like a resurrection to eternal death rather than eternal life. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, and yeah, oh, Jocelyn, yeah, no, it's not like the the cycle, the regular cycle. Like, it's not like Jesus is resurrected every 500 years. Yeah, no, no, it's just that like this, uh, the, this property of the phoenix is like a type of Jesus's resurrection. Um yeah, and a, you know, a foretelling of the resurrection to come. It just sort of, it illustrates the resurrection pattern, which, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, an important pattern. That's, that's, that's one of the points of nature, right? This is why medieval bestiaries are so much fun, because they're not natural history. This is not like, let us make careful and objective observations of animals and how they behave so that we can understand the behavior patterns of animals better. That's not the point. That's not the point. It's not that they were ignorant about animals or didn't pay attention to them. It's that they were doing something entirely different, right? They were saying, let us see how we can, through stories about animals, illustrate some of these spiritual truths. Right? I mean, they were allegorizing from the from the get go. Right. That's why they chose to include these animals, uh, these particular animals, because they were like allegorically useful. It's like it's it's all about learning stuff. It's all about it's all about um, edification. Uh, so the phoenix is edifying in that way. It sort of show it's it illustrates the whole re re resurrection pattern, which is good for us to. Um, um, uh, uh, which is good for us to 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 think about. Okay, fine. That second one, I didn't even know that I understand this. And just as he who falls and knows not how. I'm going to skip the middle bit. Just as he who falls and knows not how, who, when he rises, stares about him, all bewildered by the heavy anguish he has suffered, sighing as he looks around. Now, I've been there, right? I've been there. Like, you trip and fall. And you, like, slam into the ground... And you get up kind of stunned and you're looking around like, what, what the heck? What did I just trip on? I don't even see anything, right? Um, bewildered by the heavy anguish he has suffered, sighing as he looks around. So did the sinner stare when he arose. Okay, so he gets hit in the back by a snake. I think it's the back. It could be the front. I mean, it's possible. But I would think the shoulders and neck, I think it's got to be the back. But it's possible that he's like 
and skewering him through the clavicular notch, but I don't think so. I think it's coming in the back. Anyway, so he gets, gets hit in the back with the snake, right? Uh, bursts into flame, collapses into ash, and then pops up again. I'd be a little discombobulated too, probably, right? But doesn't this seem like a weird simile? Like it, like comparing a big thing to a little thing? I mean, it's like he's literally saying when you get, like, when you spontaneously combust and then get re you know, like immediately reassemble into a living human being again, it's kind of like when you fall down and then get back up again. Well, it's a little bit like that, but not all that much. I don't know that, I mean, I, you know, I guess it's comparing it to an experience that, like, we've all had, I guess. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, Devorah, you're suggesting this is, okay, l let me not skip the middle bit, Devorah. Just as he who falls and knows not how, by demon's force that drags him to the ground, or by some other hindrance that binds man, who, when he rises, stares about him. Okay, so this is not a tripping and falling situation. The demon's force that drags him to the ground. So Devora is in, is reading this as he's had a seizure, or something like that. Anyway. So it's not just you've tripped and fallen. This is you've fallen f for a cause, like a seizure, say. Like an epileptic seizure or something. Gripped by a demonic attack, such as an epileptic seizure, um, which could certainly have been interpreted in that way, um, or by some other hindrance that binds man, right? I mean, it's... Which even opens up Devora like quite literally, you know, a perfectly mundane medical affliction that binds you. Um, that's a New Testament word in conjunction with this kind of thing. Um, yeah. He's still comparing this quite spectacular spiritual event to something comparatively mundane? But I think the important thing, it's about that demon's force that drags him to the ground. Um, not only the experience of having something like a seizure, but of something gripping you all of a sudden, right? You're going along, minding your own business, and then wham! You're grabbed by something, and, like a seizure, right? And then you like you recover from it, and you are um, bewildered by the heavy anguish that you've suffered, sighing as you look around, having no idea what just happened or what's going on, right? That that was the look on this guy's face, okay, for much more reason. Like, this guy just burst into flame and was reconstituted. Similar, but way more extreme. So this guy is being compared to, like, the one extraordinary but still more mundane experience and the other more very unusual, like, experience that is compared to a phoenix, which is at the very least a very rare creature um, and an unusual thing, a great thing on the one end, a lesser thing on the other end. Oh, how severe it is, the power of God, that as its vengeance showers down such blows. So again, the emphasis on just the blow. Just so like the snake, the snake that hits him, burns him up, and then he's reconstituted is the power of God showering down this blow upon him. Okay. I still don't know what his sin was. I still don't know why we're combining snakes and fire like this. Wait a second. Having asked that question in that way, I just thought of the answer. I realized that I just passed a Bible quiz. Okay. Here's an Old Testament quiz, folks. It's an Old Testament quiz. Snakes and fire. What do you got? Associate. Snakes and fire. Ah, uh, Devorah. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Uh... 
It's just what I'm thinking. Um, yeah, the fiery serpents in the wilderness that are that are afflicting the Israelites until they put the bronze serpent, Stephen, yeah, on the pole. Exactly. Exactly. They raise up the bronze serpent and then the snakes stop biting them. Yes. I think so. Why? What are these people's sin? We're just about out of time. Can I sneak in one more? One more. The sinner heard and did not try to feign, but turned his mind and face intent toward me, and coloring with miserable shame, he said, I suffer more because you've caught me in this, the misery you see, than I suffered when taken from the other life. I can't refuse to answer what you ask. I am set down so far because I robbed this sacristy of its fair ornaments, and someone else was falsely blamed for that. So what's the sin? Theft? Sacrilege? Theft of the ornaments of the sacristy sounds like robbing a church might be a special subset of theft. Um... Theft, well, yep. Did he blame somebody else? He didn't say that. I robbed, like that, he committed a crime. He robbed the church. And someone else was falsely blamed for that. Is he trying to deflect the rest of his sin? That he lied about it? That he blamed somebody else? It sounds like he didn't do that lying. Again, maybe he's just... He really doesn't want to admit it, so maybe that's the case. Um, yeah, if he... I mean... Right. Uh, yeah, Michael is thinking this is like a mistakes were made kind of situation. It's possible. It's possible. Um, yeah, at the least he allowed it to happen. Sure. I mean, he didn't, like, confess and set the record straight. Um... He did allow them to be blamed, sure, sure. Um, yeah, David does point out that it would make sense then that he's compelled to answer uh, if, like, one of his, if his sin, um, you know, in life was basically, you know, not admitting what he did. Um, theft? Lying? Tune in next week when we try to figure out about the snakes uh, and the fire and the even more uncomfortable snake human penetration that we are going to uh, uh, be the beneficiaries of long and loving descriptions of uh, in Canto 25. So we will get to that next time. Thanks for joining me. I won't, I won't keep you up super late to make you read uncomfortable snake penetration passages. So next week <laughs> next week and that's a promise um thanks everybody for joining me uh and i will see you guys next time don't forget uh if you would like to try one of our path classes for free send us an email path at um thanks very much everybody and i will see you guys next week bye now <laughs>